Oh yeah, it's mind pop time. All right, uh, I got a surprise giveaway for you today. This is a great surprise. All right, so here's what you do, by the way, to win a prize whenever we drop these episodes. So when we drop them in the first 24 hours, and by the way, hang tight, I'm going to tell you what you can win today. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours underneath this video. Make it a good comment. If we pick your comment, if we decide your comment is the best comment of all the comments, it's the king comment, then you will win a prize. And today's prize is amazing. So there's two things, right? Here's the first thing. You win a copy of the Resistance Training Revolution. This is a book that I just published. It's really, really good. I know because I wrote it. But here's the second part. You may get one of the following things. Either I'm going to sign it personally myself on the inside or you'll get a naked picture of Justin. And uh, believe me, you're going to want to see that. It's really nice. Uh, think cakes and plates. Cakes and plates. All right, real quick before we get started, one more thing. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, and check out our promotion. There's only two days left as of the dropping of this particular podcast for this promotion. 50% off MAPS Anabolic or 50% off our Shredded Summer Bundle. All right, both are half off. There's only two days left for this promotion. You can learn more at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just remember to use the code April Special. All right, enjoy this podcast. The, the fitness space is so full of... Uh, incorrect information, stigma, stereotypes. I can't think of one that's more damaging mm. than the inaccurate stereotypes and stigma that surrounds uh, lifting weights. Yeah, It's got to be one of the most damaging. It's funny. What would you guys think of Muscle Beach Party when I put that up on oh, the man. Oh, movie? This is yes. cringeworthy. Yeah. <laughs> man, the boys are here, the girls are here, and the muscle men are here. Bikini chicks are the bait and romance the reward. Yeah, that, so that's uh, those are that was a popular string of like or c class or category of movies in the late fifties and then especially in the sixties where it was like Frankie and Annette I think was the the name of the the two that were always in them mm -hmm. and it's like Muscle Beach Party or Beach Blanket Bingo or a bunch of all these different movies and they were always set in California there was always surfers yeah. And there were always bodybuilders on the beach, and they were popular movies. They were popular like drive-in movies for dates. Yeah. But the bodybuilders were always depicted in a particular way, and it was really one of the first like mainstream media ways that bodybuilders were put out there. Yeah. And it created this very hard, almost impossible to erase stigma that surrounds. Oh, it uh, still persists training. today. Like you, you, like I think a lot of people still associate a lot of lifting weights with uh, that type of a person. You know, like the guy that's just like so incredibly into himself and just like looking at his muscles the whole time yeah. and super stiff and everything. I had yeah. no idea these this like genre of movie like existed. I didn't know this was a thing. And it does explain a lot. You know, if you talk to someone like um, Tom Bilyeu, who like loves to talk about, um, you know, movies and the role they played oh, on culture yeah on yeah. culture and if you read books like uh, hit makers that's a great book that gets into all that like movies play a huge role in our culture and if that was what was going on in the 50s that was really kind of setting the table for what probably came in the late 60s and 70s it makes a lot of sense that that's what the stigma was around bodybuilders yeah these these are the i believe it or not these are the movies that int that made arnold want to come to uh, California in particular. He would watch these movies in Austria or Europe, right? So he's just kind of like poor kid. He's a bodybuilder out there. And he would dream of coming to California because he would see these movies and see people like Dave Draper, who was a bodybuilder, mm -hmm. who would be in some of these movies. It's funny too, the names that they would give these guys in the movies were like Hulk, <laughs> yeah. Sulk, yeah. Flex, you know, Martian. Galaxy Flex. Or yeah, whatever, Mr. Yeah. Galaxy, you know. And, and it, it was they were totally uh, stereotyped in these uh, particular movies. But yeah, that's what motivated... Arnold uh, to originally come over is he saw us like, I want to go on those beaches and I want to be in movies uh, like these guys are. Yeah. But it did, it really, and you know, if we go back to kind of the origins of uh, weightlifting, um, it, the whole time it's kind of been pushing this this stigma, if you if you will. Like, oh, you think so? I, I kind of feel like, like old timey lifting was more like circus, functional strength, kind of more like strength feats. And this is where I would think that it started to make this transition into more of aesthetics and the way you look. It mm -hmm. is. But what mm -hmm. I mean by that is the if you go back to the – or I mean, we don't have to go all the way back, right? Because I know the Greeks used uh, forms of dumbbells and resistance training, all that stuff. But you look at like strong men, strong women. They were – you're right, circus acts. 
They wore. They would typically wear something that you would singlet, right? No, no. Uh, either a singlet or they wear like this one strap, the one strap, yeah, furry singlet, like yeah, to look yeah. like a like caveman. caveman. Yeah, yeah. And they were never lean. They were just big, obese, really strong people. And then the women would do it as well, but they would give them like these masculine names, and that's kind of how it started. When gymnasiums first started, they were literally, literally gymnasiums, and you did it. And this is how it worked, by the way. You'd go in. And they would start the workout, and everybody would do the same thing. So mm-hmm. it'd be like, and then you'd have somebody counting one, two, three, and people would be like doing stuff on the rings or whatever. And it were, women weren't allowed typically; it was yeah. just men that were doing this. That's kind of how it started. Then you, again, you had the strong men, and then the, you're right. The big popular media initially were these muscle beach movies, and the bodybuilders were always depicted as dumb, uh, interested in their only in their bodies. Uh, they were stiff, oiled, self-absorbed, up, self-absorbed. And they were kind of made fun of or poked at right. uh, in these movies. Yeah, I mean, he even referenced of like like he owned them. All right, boys, line up, stand tall. Let's have a great line. Let's put real nice for the lady here. Stand tall now. That's what This is rock. Yeah. Oh, the oh, you, uh, was it Don Rickles' character? When yeah, he was yeah, there, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I own these. They're yeah. all mine. <laughs> all mine, like, like, like they're cattle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you move to, and so that was the original kind of belief. And so at that time, if it was the '60s, and you, by the way, here's an interesting thing: if you watch this movie, I, you know, I would love people to just pull up Muscle Beach Party. Go well, watch I'm, it on I'm sure Andrew will pop it up so people can see a clip of it. These guys, although they look like they work out, if they were walking around on a beach today. Uh, they wouldn't really stand. They wouldn't stand out that so much. So that, so that's yeah. the part of all of this that was the most fascinating to me is how much that. I mean, I I've seen how much it's evolved just in the '80s so since I've been born to now, and like what you look at, you know, competitive physiques. I mean, they've already what what you would consider what a guy that took first place, you know, on stage just two decades ago wouldn't even place today. And they wouldn't place in a uh, in a local amateur, show. Yeah, yeah, amateur show. That's I mean, so the level of you know expectation on what this the the, the extreme you know fitness looks like is just it's gotten crazier. And crazier. Like these guys look like they work out yeah. and they just like average guys. Yeah, they, yeah. they, they with look, muscles. Yeah, I mean they don't look bad, but they don't look like what you not even on Instagram what you would post if you were a fitness person. Yeah, no, I've yeah. okay so. My body's looked like that and on YouTube, and I've gotten shamed for it. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. That's what makes me think of that. I'm like, wow, you know, this, how wild is that? That is something that, you know, we revered back then and just thought and admired, like, oh my God, this is so amazing back then to now. You, if you're in fitness, if you quote unquote, you would be mocked or made fun of for not having, yeah. and, you know, well, it also speaks to the evolution of, of that whole way of training and, and trying to look you know, as crazy as possible. And I, I think that's where like, you know, bodybuilding really started to, you know, get this crazy momentum and, and like, how far can we go with this? Yeah. But even then, even then, if you look like those guys in the sixties and you're on the beach, you were a freak. You were not. They, yeah. Back then that was totally abnormal. You were a freak. You were not a normal person. You were a freak and all the stereotypes applied. You were, you know, you know, you, Oh, you, you're bulky. You're very stiff. In fact, Athletes for a long time didn't even touch weights because the belief was that lifting weights made you muscle bound. And this is, by the way, this is a stigma that we re- relatively re- recently got rid of. Well, yeah, they even you can even see the way they characterize them in the show. They're all walking, all with their their lats all flared and, yeah. and all like a robot in there and stuff. That you, and you know they're being told to to hold those positions. For all we know, one or two or three of those guys could be incredibly flexible, but. They they positioned them that way from the very beginning, and so that's carried on. Oh, like dude, you said forever in, in this in the fifties, six. I mean, of course, before, but fifties, sixties, seventies, and even the eighties. If you you weren't lifting weights, if you were in sports, football besides weightlifting, right? But besides Olympic weightlifting, football was one of the first sports that were athletes started lifting weights and it really didn't start becoming popular till the 80s mm-hmm. if you were on a football a professional football team in the 60s your coach would get mad at you for lifting weights because it's going to make you stiff and unathletic this we, was the belief we still got that i mean especially like transitioning from football to basketball like the coach would 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 bench us because it was like there was this 
thought that like we you know we worked out all the time and like we were too muscle bound or whatever to you know to have that kind of skill set where we could you know use that on the court and and be athletic still and and, and he would always like give our coach grief yeah. about like working us out too much yeah like, now this is a success story of of uh resistance training because now uh you'd be hard pressed to find any athlete i don't care what sport that doesn't incorporate some form of resistance training golfers now do resistance training as part of their training. So that's one success story. But for a long time, it was like a no-no in every single sport. Um, It's going to make you stiff. It's going to take away from your performance. Now, do you guys think that that some of that stigma has some merit, though? Do you believe that it it did stem from some of these people being unbelievably muscle bound and not flexible it wasn't because and of not the, athletic it wasn't because of the muscle it was because you had the, the yeah the way you you didn't uh incorporate well, that, your skill okay. training so uh, alongside yes, it. of course i understand yeah. that right. right but my point that what i'm asking right now is like do you think that it was it was warranted because back then we didn't have the same knowledge that we have today around weight training and dieting and so maybe a, a lot of these you know meatheads that were lifting back then were really muscle bound, weren't very flexible, did lose or watch their athletic performance decline, and so there was some value behind people thinking. This no, way. I'll tell you what happened, and and, and this is actually uh, there's a few authors that go deep into this, and you guys will know this because of your experience in training clients. If you take anybody, I don't care who you take, and you have them do proper resistance training, their flexibility, mobility, and athletic uh, abilities will improve a little bit. No, anybody. Now, if you take a somebody who lifts weights all the time, look at me, I lift weights all the time. Put me on a, a court to play a sport, that, and you're going to think, oh, he's not athletic. Part of the problem is a lot of these bodybuilders in those days they looked muscular. So your assumption is because he's muscular, he's probably he could probably throw a baseball really well. He could probably, but they didn't play sports. Mm-hmm. What they did is they lifted weights. So the perception was. He should be able to because he looks more muscular than oh, an athlete. That's a, that's a good point. But yeah. he never plays sports, and, but they didn't know that. They thought it was the weight training that made them that way. The reality is they just lifted weights. Well, I mean, I was kind of guilty of that in the, the training sphere. We had all these trainers that were like super built and, and their bodies and their physiques were, were crazy. But yeah, we'd go to play something like softball and I couldn't believe like how many, many of them couldn't even hit a baseball. It's because your perception is, oh, they should be able to. Right, right. They look right. athletic, therefore they're probably Yes, athletic. but the yeah, reality is if you, don't, if you don't train in sports, you're not going to be good at those sports. Right, right. Now, anybody who lifts weights properly, will improve their athletic performance generally. Now, you're going to become a great athlete, but you're better off because you do resistance training. So it never takes away from, it always contributes. Now, in the cases where it may take away from, it's literally when you're an athlete and you trade skill for for resistance training. Right, right. You're an athlete, you, you play your sport five days a week, you don't weight train, and then all of a sudden you go from that guy to, oh, I weight train five days a week and I stop playing my sport. Yeah, of course you're going to lose athleticism, but it's not because of the resistance training. It's you lost the focus on you know, on skill or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's where that perception came from. That makes from, a lot more sense. And it stuck around for a very long time. Now, the reason why that one is a success story is one of the wonderful things about sports, especially sports where you score points or that are objective, is that at some point, whatever works is going to come out to the top. So I I could believe whatever I want about resistance training, but if this team keeps kicking everybody's ass, then what are they doing? And, um, okay, well, we got to try that out. And so this is the beauty of a lot of, of sports is that the best skills and techniques eventually take over because they're all focused on winning. Um, but you don't see this in, in other uh, realms because it's not as objective. And so a lot of the stigma – still applies. Mm -hmm. And then you move to the 70s, right? So you have all these muscle beach movies of the 60s that perpetuate this, this, this note. And by the way, would any woman ever want to work out when all the examples of, of, of using weights are these muscle beach, you know, guys? Dudes. Yeah, Yeah, of course not. Why why would I want to look like that guy? Right. Right. So, so that's where it started. Then in the 70s, you have a documentary that actually goes mainstream, uh, won awards, Pumping Iron. And this was like, uh, this wasn't just a dramatization. It wasn't just characters. It was true. Like, this mm-hmm. is a documentary. The greatest feeling you can get in a gym or the most satisfying feeling you can get in the gym is the pump. Let's say you train your biceps. Blood is rushing into your muscles, and that's what we call the pump. 
your muscles get a really tight feeling, like your skin is going to explode any minute. You know, it's really tight. It's like somebody blowing air into into your muscle. It just blows up, and it feels different. It, it feels fantastic. And you had the this. By the way, if it wasn't if Arnold wasn't in Pumping Iron, I don't think it would have done what it did. But Arnold's right. super charismatic, and people watched it like crazy. And what you saw was the very extreme version of weight training, which was bodybuilding, mm -hmm. and that started put that just pushed well, it. It just solidified out. it for women, yes. right? Yeah. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, this is what the result is. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so what did that look like in terms of competitions uh, before that movie? Because I know that that propelled this. Uh, you know, it really like elevated a lot of the tension around those competitions. Yeah. So bodybuilding um, really started getting more and more pop. Every decade got more and more popular. Now, so. simultaneously, though, we're also watching like the you know emergence of someone like uh, Jane Fonda, right? coming on the scene and like because of course there's people there's women at this time that want to lose body fat or want to look better quote unquote the 70s is when the fitness I, I i would say the fitness industry kind of got its foothold this is when it started growing you're right people yeah. like jane fonda and people selling videos or you know uh you know, workout books and stuff like that this is when it kind of started this is when the gym industry was starting to kind of figure out how they could become an industry. Mm -hmm. Not yet. That started happening in the 80s, but it started during that time. And so in the 70s, you're right, uh, women were told to not lift weights. Yeah. Uh, people like Jane Fonda would say things like, uh, short reps, lots of reps, right. don't use weight. You don't want to get bulky. You just want to get sculpted toned. and toned. This yeah. is when toned became a word probably around the 70s or 80s. And so the stigma keeps getting uh, pressed. And then you had, you know, the action movies of the 80s and 90s. Oh, my favorite era. Yeah. <laughs> They're great, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And the action movies were always uh, big, muscular, buffed, you know, he-men. Hulkian kind of dudes. Yeah, Arnold and Sylvester Stallone and Dolph Lundgren and all these other guys. Even Bruce Lee in uh, martial arts movies. Bruce Lee, people don't realize this, he lifted weights a lot. In fact... He would train with uh, with bodybuilders to mm -hmm. learn how to do resistance training, like Bill Pearl. If you see him in Enter the Dragon, now he's genetically a small guy, mm -hmm. but if you see him, he's a very muscular dude. He didn't develop that doing uh, Jeet Kune Do. He developed that physique lifting. He does a lat spread. If you watch uh, um, Return of the Dragon or Enter the Dragon, mm -hmm. when he's warming up and cracking his knuckles and he does this, this lat spread and you hear everything cracking, whatever. Uh, Flex Wheeler, one of the top bodybuilders uh, of the 90s, says that's what inspired him to bodybuild was that lat spread mm. that Bruce Lee did. So it, it was it continued to kind of push this like, this is what weight training does, and that's really the only value. You want to look like the guy who killed the predator? You want to look like a bodybuilder? <laughs> yeah. This is what you Universal do. soldier. <laughs> yeah, So and it, and it turned off. Uh, it even turned off a lot of men. Um, in fact, I remember. Yeah, you had to be a guy that really desired that, which is not everybody. No, there's most a, people. Yeah, a lot of men do not want that. In fact, we, yeah, there's a minority of us that like really pursue that that look because even statistics show that. Right, you've talked you talked about this on the show before that women don't even like that look. They'd prefer a more normal looking, average looking guy over the like overly buff looking dude. In fact, the uh, guys who started lifting weights seriously in those those decades were were typically like my story right insecure skinny no i want to be the big buff guy right it wasn't the guy who was eh. well remember it was even promoted that way remember the old articles of yes like they, they, uh, you know the skinny little weak boy and his girlfriend the guy get, at the beach that was yeah kicking sand in his face. yeah the girlfriend gets stolen by the the buff guy comes over and says you come with me and yeah, so yeah. then he goes and he buys a program then gets buff and then he's come back and fight for his girlfriend yeah, back. mac i think it was his name it was yeah. a charles atlas. charles atlas yeah. yeah yeah it was his dynamic tension routines this is the back of, of every comic book uh, mm -hmm. and, and and again it just continue to push that perception. So if you're a guy back then and you played sports in high school, you stopped working out, you're like, ah, I want to get back into shape. You're not thinking bodybuilding, not at all. I don't want to care about looking like those meathead idiots or whatever. I just want to get back into shape. So I'm going to start, I don't know, playing sports. I'll start running, start doing something else. And definitely women weren't, weren't touching the weights at all. In fact, I started working out in gyms in the mid 90s and you would not see a woman in the weight room at all. No. Never. Not in the mid-90s. Gyms no. had separate areas for women. They were actually segregated, and the women's area had no free weights except for maybe five-pound dumbbells. They were like yeah. pink or purple. Mm -hmm. And they had some machines, but yeah, the machine, small machines and the stacks were real light, and they had colorful, you know, whatever. And 
there wasn't anybody really doing traditional resistance training. It was still mainly, you know, these people who, who wanted to look like what the stereotype was at the time. There was nobody really lifting weights for general health uh, and general fitness. So that's really the 90s. And the women who were fit in the 90s, 80s and 90s in movies, if they ever showed them working out, they weren't lifting weights. No. They were running. Mm -hmm. They were running or doing some form of cardio. Jazzercise. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, dude. Yeah. Jazzercise was the thing. Yeah. Yeah. My those, mom hey, still does it. I was going to say, aren't those, uh, they're making a comeback right now. What are the, the leg warmers? Oh. Leg warmers are coming back right now. Oh, so. man. <laughs> yeah, I just remember all those movies like Flashdance and all this stuff. Yes. Like, that was a big thing. Yes. Did you guys, so, uh, it's so funny. Um, God, what's that movie with John Travolta? Staying Alive? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, great movie. <laughs> I, yeah. I love that movie when I was younger, but. Cool. But uh, that was that disco movie, right? Mm -hmm. Then they had part two where he goes to Broadway and he does this big show. And it wasn't nearly as popular. I thought it was great because I was a big John Travolta fan. But in that, he takes his shirt off and he's got this like lean, muscular physique. What people don't know and which he never really shared was he trained with bodybuilders uh, to look like that because he wanted to look fit and muscular. Now, everybody thought... And the way they promoted From the dancing. That's how he got muscular. Yeah, was yeah. He, now, he did do a lot of dancing yeah. for the here, film. And hence comes uh, Dirty Dancing not long yeah, after that, right? Patrick That's right. Swayze. Which you know he was lifting weights too. They yeah. were. And so people in Hollywood were starting to incorporate resistance training, but it wasn't even something you wanted to say. In fact, for a long time, it was considered cheating. This is true. It was considered cheating that you lifted weights. So if someone said, wow, you look really good. And if you said, I lift weights, you'd be like, oh, you know, oh okay. that, yeah, it doesn't count. Yeah. It was very strange <laughs> That's weird. mentality. And so what you get from this was kind of this, this terrible stigma. And bodybuilders didn't help it, by the way. Bodybuilders are so extreme to begin with. And, you know, uh, to be fair, bodybuilders were the ones that introduced resistance training at all. Nobody even knew about it before that. And, of course, uh, you know, and bodybuilders did a lot of experimentation on themselves to figure things out. Mm -hmm. But like any, you know, aspect of anything, I don't care what you talk about, whether it's business fitness, whether it's nutrition, if you look, look at the most extreme examples, that's a bad a representation of what you would probably get from, you know, in, in, incorporating some of the stuff that you're looking at. Right? Well, especially something like this, because, you know, you could spend most of your life trying to look like one of these guys and, and you, you won't and you won't, mm -mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like literally trying your hardest to, that, I mean, that's how difficult it is to reach that level of physique, not to mention, you know, here we are heading into the 70s and 80s, and now the introduction of drugs and stuff are happening. So mm -hmm. then it gets exaggerated even more. So you already have this exaggerated group of, you know, you know, men that are lifting weights that already look so different than the average person. Mm -hmm. And then you go throw hormones and stuff on that, and science starts evolving around nutrition, and we start learning so much more. And now you think... Oh my God! If I touch weights, I'm gonna look like Ronnie Coleman. Like, I mean, how many how many female clients did you train when in your early I, part I of remember, your career that would say shit like? Oh, that? I remember. Yeah. I would, you know. In, luckily, I'm convincing, so I convince, especially in the early days, right? I have to convince women, like, no, we're gonna do heavy barbell squats, and I know your goal is to is to lose weight, but here's why it'll work, and I do my whole thing, and then they would, you know, they'd kind of start with me, but you could tell they were apprehensive, and then after we do a workout. Uh, and especially after they got their first pump, I would always get this comment. They'd be like, um, my legs feel bigger. Like, and I'm like, listen, you didn't just build muscle <laughs> right now. Yeah. And they would be afraid. Am I going to like be really bulky? I said, it doesn't work that way. Uh, there's no, nothing I could do will make you bulky tomorrow. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. And I'd have to constantly explain myself, but it was so ingrained in their head that this is what resistance training does. And there's no other value. Um, that it was this constant conversation. You know, when it comes to fat loss, for example, resistance training, lifting weights was never even in the conversation. No. It wasn't a way to lose weight. I, I bet you if you find fitness books from the 70s and the 80s and maybe even the 90s, they won't lift, they will not list uh, resistance training as a form of exercise for fat loss. It was a form of exercise for weight gain, mm -hmm. but never for fat loss. But, and the irony of it is the it's the most effective form of exercise for fat loss. By the way, studies now completely confirm. I'm not just speaking as a personal trainer, but when you look at studies where they do like diet, because you have to, you know, it's just exercising to lose weight is a very tough strategy. It's almost always going to fail. Well, that was the problem. We were measuring it this way, right? Mm -hmm. We were measuring it in a one hour block, mm -hmm. you know, and from, and we, and the, the one law, law of thermodynamics, which is okay. If I'm trying to, you know, burn more calories and I compare all the different types of weight training modalities to 
purely running, running wins on, on a calorie perspective, but there's so much more that goes into it. So a lot, I think the research was sent, was centered around that. There really. wasn't even any research. It was literally just that. Yeah. It was that paradigm. And, and now here's what the studies show very clearly. When you combine resistance training with diet, what you lose is fat and you oftentimes gain muscle at the same time, or you definitely don't lose any muscle. Mm -hmm. When they combine other forms of exercise with diet, usually it's a 50-50 spread. You lose half muscle, you lose half, half body fat. Now, here's the interesting thing. I love explaining this to people because it, it blows their mind. If you lose 10 pounds, half of it's muscle, half of it's body fat, your body fat percentage is the same. You've just become a smaller, weaker, flabby version of yourself. So you mm -hmm. are the same body fat percentage, just smaller, now with a slower- Well, I shared, I shared this story uh, on an interview I just did. I'm sh I think I've shared it on the podcast before. But it reminds me of this client that I had um, not that long ago. She's a, a good friend of mine, and and she wanted to compete. She wanted to do a show, and she was probably about, you know, she probably, probably needed to lose somewhere between 20, 25 pounds, somewhere around there. And uh, and when I first assessed her and had her, like, track her food and kind of see where she's at, um, I told her, no, I said, you're, you're not ready to do that. You're not ready to try and get on stage right now. Your metabolism isn't in a healthy place. And uh, she ignored me, and she ended up hiring somebody else. Now, I had taught her already then like her food tracking and she was following good programming. She was following our stuff back then. And I used to have her periodically uh, hydrostatic way. So, you mm. know, one of the most accurate ways to find her body fat percentage, right? And so she goes and she, she tests her body fat percentage before she starts this prep, before she gets ready for a show. And then she gets ready, right? And she drops like 25 pounds. And she's like ecstatic. Right? So she's, she's like, ah, Adam was wrong. Let's right, her. right. She gets on stage. I actually went to the show to support her and stuff like that. She's a good good family friend of ours. And uh, we go there and she actually weighed herself. She did the dunk, right? And got her body fat percentage. But she didn't want to look at it until after stage. She didn't want to be in her head before she did it. So she went and did her, her thing. She's all happy and proud that she accomplished it. She lost 25 pounds. And then she opens up the the results with me and the body fat percentage went up mm. and she's like, she gets, she gets all emotional. She starts crying. How is this possible? I don't understand. I feel like I'm the smallest I've ever been. I've never, I've never looked like this before. I worked so hard. I was so perfect on my diet for the last 12 weeks. I didn't make one mistake. I didn't miss the gym one time. I didn't miss a cardio session. And this says that I have higher body fat percentage mm -hmm. than what I don't understand, Adam. And I broke it down to her. I said, well, you lost 25 pounds, but 13 of those pounds came from muscle. Yeah. Your butt, you lost 13 pounds of muscle on your body. And so there was a higher ratio of muscle loss than actually body fat. Mm -hmm. So technically you got fatter, even though you got small. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that just tore her apart. But this is happening all over all the time to just normal people, not just people that are going to the extreme to competing and getting on stage, but people that are deciding, hey, I'm going to make a change today. I'm going to start to lose this body fat that's been plaguing me for the last few years. And this is what they do. Well, and also too, like this kind of, uh, you know, also like reminds me of the BMI science that that is is perpetuated still by uh, doctors. And, and this is, this is, you know, something they have to have something that's standardized. They have to have like an easy way to kind yeah. of explain to people that like you need to lose weight. You Otherwise know? you got to teach a bunch of doctors how to do a body exactly. fat. Exactly. Yeah. Otherwise you have to like discern like what kind of tissue is, is, optimal what kind isn't and and you know but but what that leaves you with is uh the, this tendency towards i have to just by any means necessary i need to get the weight off and so i need to you know reduce calories uh you know weight training is going to build this bulky physique right i'm gaining more mass and so that's that's still a stigma that's around you know lifting weights is that now you're going to build more mass and you're going to have this fat to go with it and so your bmi is going to be high mm -hmm. uh, and, and the doctor doesn't discern whether or not you know you have a healthy amount of tissue and muscular tissue uh, versus fat which we've already been seeing too all these new studies coming out showing you how protective muscle tissue is for your organs no this that's a it's such a great point and, and muscle is very very protective. Mus muscle, more muscle reduces your risk of diabetes and Alzheimer's and dementia. It speeds up your metabolism, which means you burn more calories all the time. It's protective against injury. It's a it's a it's a tissue that is so active that it's more likely. More muscle is more likely to raise good hormones and lower bad ones. It's a buffer 
against cortisol. So it's a very, very good thing. And BMI just measures total weight. And obviously, look, I could cut one leg off, my BMI goes down, right? Yeah. But is that a, a good uh, type of weight loss? No, it's not. Now, we got to talk about why people lose muscle when they do it the wrong way. Right. And it's not, in, now the belief was that the body burned the muscle as right. a form of energy. It's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, the last tissue that your body, well, besides organs, the last tissue your body wants to burn to use as energy is muscle. It really doesn't want to do that. So then you might be wondering, well, why the hell then did Adam's friend lose 13 pounds of muscle? Because their body adapted to the, the type of stresses that she placed upon it and to her nutrition. And the type of stresses that she started to place upon it was lots of calorie burn through cardiovascular activity. I'm going to do a lot of cardio. I'm going to burn tons of calories. And very little food and energy. And very little food and energy. And the resistance training probably changed as well. I'm sure she did more cardio with weights than she did you know, strength training. Now, the result of that is this. Look, the body's like, we don't need to be strong right now. So we don't need much strength. We're burning lots of calories through manual activities. This is very different than through just burning calories through our normal metabolism. So burning lots of calories. We don't need lots of strength. So here's what we need to do. We need to, to become more efficient with calories to kind of offset all this calorie burn that we're doing through Get activity. rid of that expensive tissue. And, and we, since we don't need to be strong, that's an easy thing to pare down. So it's the same thing. Look, it's no different then if you put a cast on your leg for a month and you take the cast off and the muscle, by the way, if you've ever had a cast, you know what I'm talking about, you lose that muscle and it's gone. Now it comes back very quickly, but initially it's gone and you, th and you think, what happened to my quad? Your quadricep, your body didn't burn off the quad. It just adapted. Your body has no reason. Your body will only ever be as strong as it needs to be. It's never going to be any stronger than it, than it thinks it needs because it's, a, it's so inefficient to do so. Remember, we evolved where calories were were sparse and we're trying to survive all the time. So why would your body make you burn more calories for no freaking reason? It's not. It's If anything, it's going to make you burn less calories or just enough to meet your demands and to make you more efficient. And so this is what ends up happening with that false paradigm. So the paradigm that, that we were taught was this. This was the fitness paradigm. Okay, weight loss happens when you burn more calories than you take in. So let's just pick the exercise that burns the most calories. Boom. That should totally be successful. Has it been successful? No. We're now look. We're now decades into thinking that the that the exercise solution for obesity is to burn a lot of calories. And where are we today? Decades later, yeah. fatter than ever. Yep. We're fatter than ever. It hasn't worked. And by the way, I'm not just talking about the average person. The average exercising person is fatter than ever because of this false paradigm. You follow people who've done lots of cardio, who do lots of running or swimming, or mm -hmm. who do classes. Now, why are they fatter than ever? Because this is what happens when you this is the par this is the when you follow that old fitness paradigm. Initially, you lose some some weight right away, real fast. And th by the way, that's what makes you think it's the it's the solution. Oh, I, you know, I, I it's working. I'm doing 45 minutes of cardio every single day, and I lost 10 pounds in like four weeks. It's definitely working. That's what happens at first. Hard plateau. Metabolism adapts. You lose muscle. Now, 45 minutes of cardio plus your normal metabolism is burning just enough calories to balance out what you're taking in. I'm not losing any more weight. This isn't working. Now I got to either cut my calories more or do more cardio. Eventually you reach a, a wall and you're like, I'm not doing any more or you give up. Then you gain the weight back, but it's not the old weight. Yeah. So if you lost half muscle, half fat, so let's say you gained you lost 10 pounds, five muscle, five fat, and you go through this process and you get frustrated and you stop. And then you gain the 10 pounds back. You didn't gain five pounds of muscle back. You, lost, you gained five, 10 pounds all body fat back. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you're worse off than you were before, mm -hmm. and it's this kind of hamster wheel of worse and worse results. Not to mention you, you're you now in a with a slower metabolism than what you probably started with. Now it's like it's a, it's this uphill battle. By the way, when you, do, when you use resistance training as the exercise portion of your fat loss journey, the fat loss or the weight loss, I should say, the weight loss on the scale starts off much slower. The cardio person loses it real quick at first and plateaus. The, the weight loss from resistance training with good nutrition starts off slow. Yeah, in fact, very, very gradual. In fact, the first month or two, the scale might not even move. Well, that, to me, that's the goal. I mean, when, yeah. when, I'm, when I'm coaching a client or when I'm managing my own you know, diet and weight and resistance training, I'm trying to stay the same. If I yeah. know that I've put on body fat, I've been inconsistent with the diet, inconsistent with training, and let's say I've added 4 or 5% extra body fat in my body than I normally have, and it's time to turn it up, right? Mm -hmm. 
turn it up to me does not mean, even though I know I put on five or 10 pounds of fat, lose weight on the scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I know that I'm, I'm going to pick up, increase the volume of training, dial in my diet, eat better, I actually want to make sure that I'm one, fed. So when I'm hungry, I want to feed. I just want to make good choices. And then two, I don't want to see the scale go really up or right. really down. You're I like, altering your composition. That's right. I'd like to hover right around there. And the beauty of that is when you do that really well, you're actually in a very satisfied place as far as food wise. Like you feel fed, you feel good. You're giving the body what it needs to adapt and build muscle. And so you feel satisfied versus staying so low and starving the body. Like you're constantly in a state of hunger and the body's going, oh, he's not going to feed me anymore. I'm going to pare down all this muscle. Now I want to add to that, Adam, because I want to be very clear. Somebody listening might think, oh, that means the first month or two, nothing happens. No, no, no. Uh, we said the scale might not move. That's right. That doesn't mean nothing happened. Remember the earlier example of where I said, the, you know, person who does it wrong, loses 10 pounds, but five pounds of muscle, five pounds of fat. So they're the same. They're just smaller, same body fat percentage. Well, what, what we're talking about is the scale doesn't move because you've lost fat and gained muscle. Mm -hmm. So if you lost, let me put it this way. If you lost four pounds of body fat but gained four pounds of muscle, that is a huge reduction in body fat percentage mm -hmm. because now you're the same weight but with way more muscle and less body fat and a faster metabolism. So for fat loss, the truth is exactly the opposite of what the – the false paradigm is, the false stigma is, resistance training for fat loss, for pure fat loss, is by far the most effective form of exercise. How about this one? Here's another one. This one today still stands today. It's it's not the best form of exercise for your heart. You want to get your heart healthy? If you go to the doctor, you go to a cardiologist, and they say, look, you need to start exercising because it looks like you've got, you know, we might have to put a stint in soon. Your heart is, you know, we need to strengthen your heart. They don't tell you to go lift weights. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you to go Which is do, so funny. do cardio. Now, to be fair, all forms of exercise done properly will have health benefits for the heart. Mm -hmm. But here's the beauty, uh, and this is what I love about uh, right now. We're starting to see studies now that are comparing different forms of exercise specifically for things like heart health. Guess what they find? Resistance training is actually better than other forms of exercise for heart health. Now, I'm not talking about cardiovascular performance or VO2 max. Now, athletic performance is totally different, right? You want endurance, definitely do endurance training. But if you want to reduce the plaque in your arteries, you want your heart to become healthier, like for longevity, because of the, the muscle sparing, fat burning, fat loss effects of resistance training, that your body ends up developing all the time, not just when you're exercising, but all the time. It's actually, a, studies now show, a superior form of exercise for the heart. And by the way, cardiovascular activity also, uh, and this is, of course, when it's a little bit abused, not just a lot, but a little bit abused. Cardiovascular activity also is connected to worse heart health. You can find these studies all over the place. You find people who do, I think it's like five days a week or more of intense like endurance type training. They actually, their heart uh, shows uh, oxidative stress and damage. Mm. And so they find that it's not good for the heart to push that way. Whereas with resistance training, we actually see benefits of the heart that we don't see with other forms of exercise. So again, it's the opposite of what we were taught. Yeah. Here's another one. Um, young people don't do any resistance training whatsoever. I'm old. We, used to, we used to think it was it would stunt your growth. That's stunt your growth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was actually told that. Yeah. So I think I remember saying that as a trainer my first couple of years, thinking that. Because People we still told think it. that today. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Because we get asked all the time, yeah. you know, when can I start my kid on resistance training? Now, to be completely honest, though, there there's a very small percentage of really young kids that I'm going to add a bunch of weight training to. Right. Right. There's a, there's no, a, resistance training takes a lot of forms. That's right. Yes. So, I mean, but that doesn't mean that there's not kids that are really young that are doing it. I mean, I've seen, I've seen kids, especially if you have like a gymnastic background. This is where I see this the most. Like I see yeah. kids that were put in gymnastics really early, early so they have incredible body control and body awareness. Mm -hmm. I can hand that 10-year-old kid some dumbbells and a barbell and teach him how to lift or her how to lift really, really well. And it's completely healthy and smart. Yep. Now you take a 10 year old who's unathletic, no experience in gymnastics, 10 years old, and you hand them dumbbells or a barbell for the first time. And they're all over the place because they have no body control. Yeah. yeah. it's it, uh, Of course, this is all with the context of appropriate training, right? Yeah. So regardless of who we're talking about, it has to be appropriate. Well, you got to develop the fundamental skill of resistance training first. Yes. So that's, I mean, if you can build off of that, you're going to build a incredible athlete that is going to carry that on with them, you know, for the long oh, haul. Oh, so. I'll, t I'll tell you something right now. Okay. If you want 
to set your kids up for uh, long-term success. If you're if you want your kids to have a lower risk and chance of becoming obese, developing diabetes, and having issues as adults, then the best thing they could do is resistance training forms of exercise to build muscle. And here's why. A lot of the stuff that happens when you're growing as a kid, whether it's the brain developing or the body developing, there's a certain level of it that actually becomes more permanent um, than if you were to do it as an adult. Like if you if you're a young kid and you get really, really strong, even if you stop working out, there's a level of it that kind of sits with you for a while. So same same thing with the brain. Like if you teach a kid different languages, they don't develop uh, an accent like an adult would. Muscle memory is a real thing. But remember, as children, especially when they go through puberty, they start to develop kind of this, this ba baseline of muscle and strength. And you can augment that through resistance training. So it's it's a great it's not only a great form of exercise for kids it's one of the best forms of exercise as far as the belief that it it stunts growth that's super false it doesn't stunt growth that's silly uh, and and that belief came from the fact that we have growth plates uh, and when we're kids and if they become damaged then the bones stop growing no kid on earth is strong enough to lift a weight that's going to damage uh, growth plates so that's not a concern unless you have a like some weird anomaly you got a ten year old that's squatting 300 pounds, um, uh, you're, you're probably, you're going to be totally fine. They can totally do resistance training. It's not going to be a problem. Then on the other end of the spectrum, old people, oh boy, old people need to stay away from resistance training. Right. That is very dangerous. They're already brittle. Oh right? yeah. Oh yeah. no. Oh, you want grandma to work out with dumbbells? No, 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 no. She's going to hurt herself. Are yeah. you kidding me? She's got bad knees. Why would she do a squat when she's got bad knees? You know, I remember, right. uh, th this is such a, uh, a, pr a prevalent, stigma. I remember getting a surgeon. This is a medical professional that hired me. A woman at the time, she was in her late 50s. Love her. We became very good friends. And when she hired me, the reason why she hired me is because one of her other doctor friends worked with me. So she heard good things. She's like, all right, I'll, I'll check this guy out. I remember we sat down. I did a goal assessment with her. And I said, you know, as part of the goal assessment, I'm asking her, you know, areas of pain or concern. And she's like, oh, I got really bad knees. So I can't do anything with any knee flexion or extension. This is a doctor telling me that. Like, I can't do any of that. If I do- <laughs> So no normal things. Yeah, so. if I, I can't. It's just I have bad knees. So I said, well, what do you mean you have bad knees? Uh, she's like, oh, they hurt and this and that. And I have a little bit of chondromalacia. And I'm like, okay, but there's no like injury. She said, no. I said, okay. I said, here's the deal. Can you trust me enough to do just slowly start incorporating some exercises? If we notice any problems, we'll definitely back off. And I convinced her and she said, okay, I'll give it a shot. The, it's so funny. I, I, and she ended up becoming one of my biggest advocates. This woman, I don't know, six months later, full lunges, full squats. At some point, a year and a half later, it took us a while. She was doing sissy squats. It's a very intense exercise. Knee pain. Not only did she get no knee pain, her knee pain was gone. Mm -hmm. And I remember her going, this is crazy. I thought adding load and resistance it damages the joints. I had no idea that it could actually make my joints feel well, better because you're loading the muscles. Right. If you're training properly, the joint the joints just work as a beautiful hinge. It shouldn't feel that way. That's a sign for a trainer that there's something wrong there that I can address and fix. Yeah. But that's I think this idea of like my back is bad, my knees are bad, my neck is bad, my shoulders are bad. Therefore, I don't want to lift weights. It's like no, that's yeah. not solving. That's a lack of strength. That's yes, right. Yes, yes. Now today, even today, here we are in the year 2021, right? So we were talking about Muscle Beach Party. I think that was 1964, and Pumping Iron was 1974. I want to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you got the 80s, and you know, with the aerobics revolution and right. Jane Fonda and all that, like all the stuff that we said. Here we are, decades later. Today, even today, the average person does not the average. And I talk about the average, not the fitness fanatic. Luckily, fitness fanatics are in the know now. Back in the day, you know, when I started training, not even fitness fanatics. Uh, really understood this. But today, if you're super into fitness, you get this. But still, the average person today, they don't pick up a barbell or a dumbbell unless they're really interested in building a lot of muscle. Mm -hmm. The average person just doesn't even work out. Like if my aunt decides that she's going to start working out because she wants to lose weight, she doesn't think to herself, I'm going to go grab, I'm going to go get a barbell and start yeah. deadlifting. No, no, they don't think that at all. They think something along the lines of I'm going to hike or run or walk or swim or bike. You know, there's nothing wrong with those. But resistance training still, for the average person, especially for women, 
But even men, even men today, if some some 50-year-old dude or 40-year-old dude, some 40-year-old engineer who just wants to, you know, lose some weight and, oh, my cholesterol is a little bad and, you know, my triglycerides a little high, I need to start exercising. And his friend says, hey, you want to come lift weights with me? No, 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 no. I don't want to – I'm not trying to get big. I'm not, I'm not trying to look like a bodybuilder. Like, what are you talking about? I just want to improve my health. Right. So th- the results of this this false marketing, false paradigm that's been pushed on us is that people who lift weights, who start lifting weights, the average person, the only ones that do it are the people who are interested in building big muscles. Everybody else is picking the, li- the least afor- uh, effective forms of exercise for the common goals that we have today, which is fat loss, health improvement, longevity. And if you mix in... The context of, you know, like I've said in the past, modern life. And by the way, I talk a lot. This is literally all the stuff I go into in the resistance training revolution, mm-hmm. right? Is this is this the, this context of modern life, which is you're not going to work out every day. Okay, The average person just isn't going to work out every day. I know everybody wants to work out every, ba- every day, but the average person, we can expect them to do about two days a week, maybe three days a week if we do a good job of getting them to develop a good relationship with exercise and consistent they're going to do maybe two or three days a week of exercise. If all you have and all you're going to do, which again is most people, is two days a week or three days a week of exercise, and your goals are fat loss, longevity, sculpt, speed up my metabolism, I want more mobility, I want my hormones to balance, I want to feel better, I want longevity, and you only can pick one form of exercise, nothing comes close to resistance training. Yeah. Every other form of exercise is yeah. in, just in terms of results. We need to get beyond the stigma. Totally, totally. Um, the other part, the result is lots of cardio. Till this day, you go to a big box gym and what you see is a lot of cardio in yeah. comparison to other forms of exercise because that's still what the average person looks for when they start working out. Now, do you think the, do you think this is shifting? Like, do you think we're starting to head in the right direction? Because I feel like, you know, there was a time when, just like you said, uh, 50% of the gym was cardio. There was only one squat rack. There was, you know, your basic set of dumbbells. Like, it does feel like to me that we are getting more excited about strength training and we're getting more into squat racks. We're getting more and, and, and less and less cardio. Do you agree? Well, I, I feel, I I've yeah, and I feel too that like all the examples we've seen, we've sort of exhausted all the extreme versions of using it, right? Like even with CrossFit, we've seen the extreme version of how to, you know, lift weights and incorporate a lot of these really valuable type of lifts. But, you know, now we're sort of transitioning. Well, well, what can we do for our health? Because health right now is on everybody's mind. Like, yeah. how, how, can I, how can I better my body and improve my body's overall function? And, and we, need to, we need to get beyond all these extreme versions of it and realize the real value. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I definitely think the time is, is coming where resistance training breaks free of that stigma and the average person looks at incorporating it or making it their primary form of exercise. And the, the driver of that is, are the, is going to be the medical community. That's the driver of it. Because the studies, here's one of the big problems with the resistance training. It was one of the last forms of exercise to be studied for health benefits. Most of the studies done on resistance training in the past were all revolved around performance, yeah. muscle building, weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting. If, if there were any studies on health, For the last few decades, I mean, not recently, because recently we're seeing more studies, but the last few decades, if it was any exercise study, it was cardio. It was, we, you know, we had subjects perform 30 minutes of cardiovascular activity in conjunction with this and studied the result. It was never, almost never resistance training unless the goal was building muscle, getting strong or athletic performance. Today, we're now seeing studies on resistance training for health. Today, now we show that a strength test, a simple strength test, a grip test, or getting up off the floor is one of the best predictors of all-cause mortality. So if you go to the doctor and the doctor wants to perform one test on you, just one, to predict your all-cause mortality, believe it or not, one of the most accurate uh, tests you could do that's simple is a grip test. If you squeeze something and you're within a certain strength, they, and then they know your all-cause mortality is is not that good or it's good or just standing up off the floor, which is a strength one. Um, we now have studies to show its effect on Alzheimer's, okay? To date, it's the only form of exercise that's been shown in studies to, to what appears to be, and this is what the researchers in the study were like, kind of blown away, to halt the progression of Alzheimer's and maybe even, according to the study, it looks like, was starting to reverse it. 
Now, to someone like me, this makes perfect sense because when you look at dementia and Alzheimer's, which can some scientists will refer to as type 3 diabetes, they think it has something to do with the brain's inability to utilize uh, sugar for energy. And one of the best protectors of that is muscle. Muscle is, it can store sugar. It's very insulin sensitive. So if you want insulin sensitivity, build muscle. I mean, every time, the more muscle you lose, the your the risk of diabetes and and those types of risks start to go through the roof. So it's the only form of exercise so far to show that it could stop the progression of Alzheimer's. Um, we have studies now on uh, bone density. There is nothing that comes close to reversing osteopenia or keeping the bone strong. Um, we're now in the middle of this kind of hormone crisis, especially with men. We've talked about this on the podcast now a few times. And there's that book that was out by uh, Shauna Swan, I think her name was. She was just on Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. talking about men's testosterone's plummeting. Um, no form of exercise raises testosterone uh, like resistance training. None. In fact, resistance training raises testosterone in all men. Low testosterone, high test. doesn't matter. If you do it right, you can expect... Uh, a, a bump in testosterone levels. And then with women, and we have yet to see like really good studies on this. This is just my experience. If I'm trying to balance out their estrogen and progesterone and uh, cortisol, I utilize resistance training far better results than other yeah. forms of exercise. So I think it's the medical community that's going to start pushing this to where the average person is going to go to the doctor and the doctor is going to say, I need you to start working out, but here's what I want you to do. I agree with that, but I also think there's a little bit of responsibility on us in, in our space. It was actually one of the things that um, it really is what made this all possible. You know, the day that you sent over on Facebook the the first version of Maps Anabolic, um, it's what made me pick up the phone and call you. It's what made me want to talk to you and potentially do something with you business wise. Because at that point, I felt like everybody in the in the fitness space was was appealing to the same people that really appealed to the bodybuilder yeah. type of image. They cared about the way they looked. They just wanted to build muscle or they wanted to have this, you know, shredded bikini look and they were not who I trained. Hmm. You know, I all of us for two decades have trained lots and lots and lots regular of people. people. Yeah. And that 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 percentage is one percent of the people I train, they're, they they are not the majority, and nobody was writing programs or talking about fitness for the clients I had, mm -hmm. and it, which it boggled me because those were the people spending money. Mm -hmm. They were spending thousands of dollars on me to coach them and train them, yet they were nothing like the the demographic of people that we're we're selling programs to right now in the fitness space. And when I saw that, like this. This idea that somebody could train a, a program one to three days a week and get great results with the most effective movements and keeping it very simple for them. It's like, this is what we were missing. This is what nobody is selling right now. Everybody is selling this idea of no days off and beast mode and the motivation and the hype and the you know creativity of adding tech and doing crazy fun stuff. It's like, no, you guys are all going about this wrong. Most people are not into fitness like you are. No. Most people, you need to change one or two little things in there. And so you need to write something for them that is very simple, yeah. very basic, but yet very effective. That's but right. keep the fundamentals. Right. That's yeah. it. That's it. And, and it was either you talk to the extreme you know, bodybuilder types and we're just trading those people and we're fighting for that little percentage. Or it was, I'm talking to the average person. And then what was it? It was you know, urban cowboy hip hop dance class. It was <laughs> lots of freaking yeah. cardio. It was extreme diets and it was it was terrible, terrible information. And nobody was saying the right stuff to those people. Now here's the here's the thing that, that gets me up every single day to do what we're doing. When when I look at the the real big health problems that modern societies face, and and, and make no mistake, these health problems threaten to bankrupt our societies more than anything else. I know there's lots of, we, we think lots of problems. Oh my God, coronavirus. Oh no. You know, we have, the truth is when you look at obesity related diseases, the cost on societies, the cost on productivity, even, even if you don't have obesity, just poor health, right? Poor chronic health. It really threatens the future. It really, really does. Just look at the numbers. Now, what segment of the market has actually has the answers to solve this? It isn't Western medicine. It isn't anything. It's the fitness and health community has the answers. And what they need to do 
is they need to communicate this in the right way. We all have a responsibility to do this in the right way. Don't go for the quick buck. I mean, I could very easily put out a, a, a diet pill or some bullshit workout program and say, lose 30 pounds in 30 days. It's a 30-day blast or whatever, and probably make a quick buck, but I've helped nobody. And then long-term, here's the truth, long-term business-wise, I've actually screwed myself because the long-term approach is to do the right thing. That's what makes you successful. Um, and that's why I, I wrote the book, The Resistance Training Revolution. I wanted to give fitness influencers who really cared, trainers, podcasters, ammunition. Here's how you talk about it. Here's how you get the average person mm -hmm. to understand. Now you have a reference. And of course, I want the average person to pick this up and read it and go, oh, this is, and by the way, I'm, I'm getting some of these comments, which is making me very excited. I've got a few of them now, my DMs, now that the book is out. I've had a few people tell me like, wow, you know, I, I found your book, never considered to do resistance training as part of my routine. All I've ever done is running or cardio or whatever, and I couldn't understand why it wasn't working, why it was so miserable, why I would eat barely you know, over a little bit of calories and gain weight. Oh my God, this makes perfect sense. I can't wait to start lifting weights. And that's what I want uh, you know, people to get out of this, and I think that's the big goal. Yeah. So look, if you like Mind Pump's content, you'll love our free written information. Go check out mindpumpfree.com. We have lots of free guides. Also, if you want to check out my book, The Resistance Training Revolution, go to theresistancetrainingrevolution.com and get yourself a copy or get someone you love a copy. And finally, you can find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. The opposite tends to be the rule. The people that need to get strength training, exercise more in their life are the ones most likely to gravitate to not exercising at all, not training, and getting them involved in, in moving and exercise is going to do tremendous things for their libido. The people that love to exercise and train hard and push them, 